Okay, good morning, church. Good morning, South Point. Happy Mother's Day. I hope everyone's having a great day today. Um, hopefully starting your day with a, a song from these four beautiful men up front and a, and a cookie just at least starts your Mother's Day early or starts it well. Listen, also, I just want all the, the men in the room to know that we were thinking about you. And we thought, you know, just in case you forget, you know, to mention that it's Mother's Day, we wanted to make sure that we had you covered here, that, that at least your, your wife would walk away with, uh, with something this morning. So, yeah, I, I think every single Sunday when I look out here and, and I see you guys, I'm just completely blown away as to kind of like, why are you here? You know, I ask myself, like, you guys could be doing anything in the week that you could, that you could imagine, you get two days off for a weekend. You get a Saturday and you get a Sunday, or at least most people do. And of all the things in the world that you could be doing in one of the most beautiful cities in the world, you're coming here on Sunday morning and you're spending uh, half of your morning with us. And I want you to know from, from my perspective, when I think about you, I don't take that for granted. Because I think, man, I cannot believe that people just keep coming back. They come back Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and it really it blows my mind. It blows my mind to see the room filled. It blows my mind to see new people coming. But I often think, especially as I drive across the bridge, leaving Pinelands after church on a Sunday, I'm like, man, why? Like, what, what is it that they, that they come for? And I know that some of you can answer that question with, uh, you know, maybe answers of, well, I had my life changed there, or my friends go there, or that's where my community is, or, or whatever it is. But I, I don't know what everyone's answer is. But an answer that I do know is to the question that is, why do we as the church do what we do? So why are we the church here? And the reason that we do what we do is, is quite simple. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very simple reason. And most churches get this wrong because they overcomplicate it. And they overcomplicate it by trying to add a whole bunch of things to it. There's just, uh, uh, they pile things on top of it. But the reason that we do the things that we do here as a church, as a church the reason that I come here on a Sunday morning uh, at, at 6 o'clock in the morning, our band comes just after 6, the reason that we have all the volunteers, the reason that I'm up here every single Sunday uh, speaking to you guys, sometimes it's a good message, sometimes it's bad, but at least I'm consistent, I'm here every Sunday, <laughs> I try, we really do try. But the reason that we have all these volunteers and men in the parking lot and the reason that we have courses during the week and all the stuff that we do, the reason that we do all of it, as far as why are we here as the church, it's because everyone needs Jesus. It's, it's that simple. I think anything that you add on to that is overcomplicating it. See, everybody needs Jesus. That, that means the person that has never had an encounter with Jesus needs Jesus. That means the person that has had a relationship with Jesus their whole life needs Jesus. We all need Jesus. See, when we think about our programming here at the church, we think everything that we do needs to be done with this focal point, and that's because we need Jesus. See, I want you to know what kind of church you're sitting in. I want you to know what the leadership of the church believe in. I want you to know what our priorities are. One thing and one thing only. When people come up and they ask me, um, you know, uh, uh, things about the church, and sometimes people will ask me, you know, what are your thoughts on this, your, your priorities on this or on that? And for me, it comes down to one thing I tell people. I say, listen, I care about one thing and one thing only. And the one thing and the only thing that I care about is this right here is we all need Jesus. This is what drives everything that we do here at the church. Now, I can tell you, I can say this with confidence. And we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks. We've been talking about the resurrection. It's because we need Jesus, we can say this because of the resurrection. See, without the resurrection, like I've said the last couple of weeks, Jesus would have just been another rabbi. He just would have been another teacher that gathered a group of men around him, that followed him, and, and he was great at teaching, great at telling parables and stories. And he even got lucky on a couple different miracles, you know, where he said, you know, hey, be healed and walked. And the guy got up and walked or a blind person got their sight. Maybe they weren't actually blind. All those things could be maybe debatable. But the fact that, that Jesus resurrected himself, 
That, that's what separates him from just another rabbi. That's what separates him from just being another Jewish man that was crucified or put to death by the Romans. It's because of the resurrection. And that's what this series that we've been talking about has, has really just been trying to hammer home to you guys. And today we're going to finish it up. But this is the most important thing. It's because we need Jesus. And it's because you need Jesus and I need Jesus. And see, when the resurrection happened... The resurrection, when Jesus rose from the grave, it started a chain reaction. And this chain reaction that it it started, the first thing that it did is it validated every single thing that Jesus said. See, when Jesus died on the cross, if you haven't joined us over the last couple weeks, when Jesus died on the cross, everything that he said and taught died with him. Even the disciples, they ran away and they hid. No one expected the resurrection. Everything died with Jesus. It wasn't this magical thing. It wasn't, like, it wasn't the way that we interpret it because we have the Bible. So in our Bible, the scripture just immediately jumps us to it. Jesus died. People went to the grave. Jesus resurrected. Everybody was happy about it. No, when, when Jesus died, everything died with him. Literally everything. Not a single human on earth thought that this man was going to rise from the dead. And because of the resurrection, it validated every single thing that Jesus said. It validated everything that he taught. It validated everything that he stood for. And then another thing that this chain reaction set off is so important is that we talked about these two guys, Peter and Paul, last week. See, Peter and Paul, they had their lives changed by Jesus. Peter, he got his through a dream. Paul, he got his through a, a blinding experience on the road to Damascus. And these two men would be the founders of the church. These two men would be the people that the church would be built on. They would be the people that would go out and minister to the Jews. And Paul would go out and minister to the Gentiles, which would be anyone that's not Jewish. And these two people left what what we call the Old Covenant, and they entered into the New Covenant because of an experience that they had with Jesus. And then the final thing that, that this resurrection sets off is this resurrection just completely ends the Old Covenant, which is the, the Ten Commandments, the laws that the, the Jewish people held. We talked about it last week. There were 613 laws that you had to abide by. 613. So they started with the Ten Commandments, and it grew to be 613 laws. There was a law that covered every part of the human body. There were, there were laws that covered all kinds of different things, but... There were 613 reasons that someone had to accomplish in order to come clean into the presence of God. And because of the resurrection, that 613 went down to one. One reason and one reason only. And it was because people had access to Jesus and because of that they had access to God. Now, if we look at our Bibles, and your Bible's divided in two, you've got Old Testament and New Testament. The New Testament is primarily about Jesus and the things that he did. The Old Testament is about some of those books a lot of us have a hard time getting through. Uh, Read Leviticus or one of those books. It's it's all these these laws and these rules, but it's, it's hard to read through. I love the Old Testament because I like reading about David who went out and murdered people. There's a guy in the Old Testament that killed a bunch of people with the, the jawbone of a donkey. I mean, it's that, there's some awesome stuff in the Old Testament. There really is. God was, was wrathful in the Old Testament. He was aggressive. He was vengeful. So the, the, the Old Testament... Was, was telling us that the Jewish people were really God's chosen people. It, it wasn't that, that God loved the world. No, the Old Testament tells us that God loved the Israelites, that the Israelites were his chosen people, and he would do everything to protect them and to pursue them. And so, really, you, you have that the, that the Old Testament isn't for you. It's not for the Gentile. It's not for the person that, that doesn't know Jesus. The, the Old Testament is, is for the Israelites. It's their covenant. It's their law. It's their rules. It's their regulations. So the, the front part of your Bible is, is about God's pursuit of the Israelites and God pr- preserving and prioritizing the Israelites. Now, this would go on to pave the way for the New Testament and for Jesus to come. And in fact, if the Old Testament tells us how, how God set the Israelites apart from the whole world, then the New Testament actually tells us how God would end up loving the entire world. See, this is the transition 
that was so important for the early church to get, and it's so important for you to get. That this is this is what gives us it unlocks all the rules and the regulations that we think that we have to that we have to live by or we have to abide to, and instead it brings it down from 613 rules to just one rule. Now, last week we were talking about Paul and Peter, and Paul and Peter had had their transformations. Peter's was amazing. He had a lazy nap on a rooftop. He had a dream in this dream. All these animals came down from heaven, and these animals were dirty. They were unclean according to Jewish custom. Peter could not eat these things. They would make him unclean and unable to go to the temple. And God told him in the dream, Peter, everything that I make is clean. Everything that I make is okay. And so Peter's like, you know, okay, I can. are you sure? God's like, yeah, absolutely. He wakes up from his dream. And this happens in real life. Uh, a Gentile, actually a Roman centurion, the worst of the worst, the person that Peter is not even allowed to go to their home. But this guy shows up and invites Peter into his home. And Peter goes. And we had this amazing moment last week where we, we talked about stepping over the threshold of a door. Because as Peter stepped over this threshold of this door, he stepped out of the old covenant and into the new covenant. Because his old covenant said, if you go into the house, you're unclean. That means you can't go to the temple. That means that you're not fit for God's presence. And Peter left that behind. He stepped into the home, in, into this new covenant. And because of that, the Holy Spirit fell. And this house, uh, with all these Romans, these Gentiles, had this amazing experience with God. And Paul had a similar experience. His experience came on the road. There was a blinding light. Paul was blinded. God sent a man to restore his sight. And when Paul got his sight, he, his eyes were open to the difference between an old covenant and a new covenant. So Paul went from killing people that were pursuing Jesus, or what they called the way, to all of a sudden trying to build the church that they were in. I mean, it's just amazing stuff. All that was made possible because of the resurrection. So if we pick up where we left off, Paul... Once he has these, this, this amazing, life-changing um, event that happens in his life, he goes 300 miles away to a city called Antioch. And this, this city of Antioch would actually be the first place that the term Christian would be applied to people. Before that, it was recognized as the way. And then now in Antioch, it becomes known as, people become known as Christians. And so the events of Antioch are going to inspire the clarification of the gospel message to the entire world. So let me tell you what's happening in Antioch. Paul goes up there to start the church. Or actually, the, the church gets started up there. And they call some people up for help. And Paul gets called up there to help. And God's moving and God's moving. And people are giving their lives over. And there's just this beautiful, simple message that people are, are presented with. And this amazing message is what we call the gospel. And if you don't know what the gospel message is, it's simple. Jesus died for your sins. Jesus loves you. He resurrected. You choose Jesus. You believe in faith. Done. It's that easy. And so these Gentiles, these people in Antioch, it's not a, a Christian city or a Jewish-based city. They're like, hey, we kind of like this. Because even our pagan gods have all these laws and rules and regulations. And so this amazing movement is happening in Antioch. It's this incredible movement. And so all these people are giving their lives over to, to Jesus, becoming Christians. The church is just flourishing, and it's being born. And so Paul and Barnabas, they leave Antioch. While all this is happening, they travel around, and they see miracles, and all these amazing thing ha things happen in other places. And so Paul and Barnabas, they work their way back around, and they enter back into the city of Antioch. Now, when they enter back into the city, it's like this beautiful homecoming, this, like, uh, this, this warm welcoming. And we actually are going to see and act here what happens when they come back into the city. It's like they're, they're, they're sharing such amazing good news. And they're saying, hey, on arriving there, I'll just interrupt this a, a little bit because I, I had this kind of stray thought. Church should be fun. Church should be a joyful thing. Church should be a place where we celebrate. Church should be a place where we as a community come together and we bring our good news together. We celebrate together. We love each other together. And that's exactly what's happening here. So on their arrival, so Paul and Barnabas come back to the city. They gathered the church together and reported, so they're telling them the stories, of all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. That's such an important statement. 
Because until Jesus resurrected, there was no door of faith for the Gentiles. There was only Jewish people. The, the Gentiles had no way to experience God or come into the presence of God. You had to convert to Judaism. You had to go through this huge, long process of doing that, if that was even possible. And Paul comes back and he says, there's been opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Isn't that such a warm homecoming? Paul and Barnabas coming to the church that's just kicked off this amazing revolution of, of people giving their lives to Jesus. And they roll in and they give more good news and they celebrate together and they stayed there a long time with the disciples. You know, when you're in a place where you're loved, you don't want to leave. You know, when I asked you before, why do you come here? I hope that for some of you, the reason why you come here is because it's a place where you feel loved. It's a place where you feel you have family. And because of that, you want to be here. You don't want to leave. And there's some people that we have to chase away after the service. And that's, that's great. I love it. I wish more people would hang out with us longer. But what happens here? What happens with the story of Antioch? What happens with this line that a door of faith is open to the Gentiles? Is that we, we now are going to have an opportunity to watch this unfold across the entire church. And even across the, the entire Jewish kind of church. And so where we have this amazing clarification here. Because we said that what, what happened in the city of Antioch was going to clarify the direction of the gospel. And that's what this statement here, open a door of faith to the Gentiles. It is now clear that the gospel message is for everybody, not just the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. And that impacts you because everyone in here, unless you're Jewish, is a Gentile. So if this had not happened, then this would not be happening. If this didn't happen 20 years after Jesus resurrected, because that's about the time frame, 20 years after Jesus resurrects, if this doesn't happen, you don't happen. This church doesn't happen. And so we think that we've got clarification here. We think that now we're ready to move on, right? It would make sense if we could do that, but it's not. Instead, we have confusion and not clarification. Now, here's why there's confusion. It's because humans get involved. People get involved. And sometimes, you know, people ask me about my job. They ask me about what I love to do uh, with, with church. And you know what? My favorite part about being a pastor is getting up here and speaking to you. And do you know why that's one of my favorite parts? Because you can't talk back to me. <laughs> I can say anything I want. I can just keep rambling on. You know what else? You know, all week long, I get your opinions. I get your thoughts. I get your troubles. I get your heart. I get to celebrate with you. You know, I get to do all of those things. But my favorite part is, is this, because you just have to sit and listen. I love this part. But what happens, and I'm just making a joke out of that, but what, what happens is that when people get involved, and even when the church gets involved with something that's so simple, it ends up getting complicated. And all of a sudden, things get added onto it. Take the Old Testament. Take the Ten Commandments. How do we get from 10 to 613? I mean, that's bananas. That, that's where people have gone in and added and added and added and added. And we do that as a church, and when we do that, it creates confusion rather than clarification. And so we're going we're gonna to see how this happens. We're going to watch it unfold. And then at the end, I'm going to bring it home to you. And so in Acts 15, 1, if you want to read along, we're in Acts today. Most of it's going to be in, in chapter 15. So this is after all the amazing things have happened in Antioch. Watch what happens. Watch what the church does. Okay, Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch. And we're teaching the believers. So, a little bit of background here. The, the Jewish church, the temple, they hear what's happening in Antioch. And it makes them nervous. Because they're like, wait a minute. These people up there are just believing by faith. They're just saying that they believe in Jesus. And they're accepting him. And not all of a sudden, they have access to God like we have access to God. That's not right. I've, I've been circumcised. I have... These guys haven't done that. I mean, they should at least go through surgery. It's like saying that the pathway to salvation is through surgery. But, but 
So they're a little bit perturbed. They're like, wait, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Have you ever worked so hard for something? I mean, just crazy hard for it. And then somebody comes up behind you and they just like get it instantly. And you want to say like, no, it doesn't work that way. You don't deserve it like that. You need to hurt for it like I hurt for it. And because of that mentality, this is why they show up. So they send people from Jerusalem to Antioch, 300 miles. Has anyone walked 300 miles? No. They, had, they, they really believed it. If they were willing to walk 300 miles with, with, with a conviction, with a burden, that, that's probably like an angry 300 miles. You know, just when Benjamin, our son, our three-year-old gets mad, he's, he's learned how to do this. I want to know which one of you in the church taught him to do that. Because he didn't learn it from me. And he didn't learn it from Casey or from, from our house. So, so one of you taught him. But he, he does this. And when he, you know, he storms off. And so I wonder if these missionaries from Jerusalem are walking 300 miles like this all the way to Antioch saying, No, that's not fair. But they show up and they, they get the believers around them and they say, unless you are circumcised, there's that salvation by circumcision, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. So they're dropping a bomb on them right there. What, we have already lost simplicity and moved towards confusion. We've already overcomplicated the thing. Because these people got involved and they said, wait a minute, you're not doing it the way we did it. It's not that simple. It's not a matter of faith. You actually have to do stuff, especially men. You have to do stuff to your body to qualify for this. And so then in in verse 2, this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute. I love the way the Bible says that. Sharp dispute. I don't know what you imagine when you think of sharp dispute. I think of like Hulk coming in and just Hulk smashing the door open and saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute, you're not going to mess up what Jesus has been doing here. You're not going to mess up what the Holy Spirit's been doing. I I am not going to lay down and accept that you are going to reteach the people that we have set free through faith, through believing in Jesus. And so Paul and Barnabas enter a sharp dispute, a debate. They're saying, no, they start arguing with each other. And so guess what? Paul and Barnabas are appointed along with some other believers, to go 300 miles to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. So here they go, taking the trip in reverse. It, it's, it's not, this doesn't have anything to do with you or me, but it's just wild that they walk 300 miles twice just to answer some questions, to prove a point, to get some clarification. You know, today we can just send an email or WhatsApp or a message, but these guys, they went 300 miles for their stuff. So they, they end up in Jerusalem. And now we read in, in verse 5. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. So here's where we've come in our story. The, the church is now fully involved. The temple is fully involved in what's happening with, with Jesus and what's happening with the Christians in Antioch. All right, so let me just sum up for you because we, we have to understand this. Jesus did this thing in Jerusalem. He died. He resurrected. Five years later, Paul had his life changed. Five years after that, Peter had his life changed. Peter kind of stays working with the church in Jerusalem. Paul goes out. God uses Paul to reach all these people that would otherwise have no access to God. And so Paul goes out and tells them a super simple message. People in Jerusalem hear about it. They send some people. They argue about it. They come back to Jerusalem. And that whole journey brings us to this point. Brings us to them having to to reconcile with and, and come to terms with what actually are we going to accept or not accept as part of coming to faith or part of the church. And so this is an interesting phrase here because if you remember the Pharisees, see the Bible's so cool if you take time to study it. The, the Bible just has so many cool things in it. A Pharisee, do you, do you remember the Pharisees are the people that put Jesus on the cross? So now here you have some of the believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees. That's saying that there are Pharisees that are believers in Jesus. Now, why would a group of people, this just reinforces the resurrection thing, Why would a group of people that were responsible for nailing Jesus to the cross, why would they now be following 
Jesus' movement. Even though they're kind of doing it wrong, they're at least following it. It wasn't because Jesus was a good teacher. It was because he resurrected. Because they watched him. They saw him raised from the dead. See, it was so powerful that it even changed the people that nailed him to the cross. So even though they've got good intentions here, they're getting the message wrong. And so they, they, they say the Gentiles have to be circumcised. They're required to keep the law of Moses. They could not let go of this. And I just want to pause and bring this to our current terms here. You know what I hate? I hate the idea that someone would come into this building looking for freedom, looking for love, looking for family, and instead they would get judgment because they maybe don't fit a mold that we think that they should fit. And I don't believe that we're that church. I believe that we are an open, welcome, loving church. And I believe that this church carries the same burden that I do. Because this here is not us. We're not going to get hung up on things like this. So why do we do what we do? Because everyone needs Jesus. And this is contrary to that. And so we can continue the story on in verse 6. The apostles and elders, so they met to consider this question. Now they're going to decide. This is going to be our answer. And after much discussion, Peter, he gets up. Peter says, okay, I'm done with this. We're now going to decide on this. Peter got up and he addressed them. He says, brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. Peter's reminding them. You know what he's reminding them of? He's reminding them of that time that God gave him a dream and he had to go to the Roman centurion's house and he had to tell them about Jesus. And when he told them about Jesus... They received the Holy Spirit just like the, the, uh, the followers of Jesus did in the upper room. Now, this is what's amazing here in verse, in verse 8. So Peter's like, hey, remember that? Remember that? Now, you're not going to doubt me because I'm Peter. So remember that? God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them, them as the Gentiles, the non-Christians in our, in our world today, showed that he accepted them By giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did for us. Now, you know what happens when we read the Bible? We get through this verse here, and then it's it's going to be the next verse, but we're not going to go to the next verse yet. Just as he did to us. Let me unpack that for you a little bit, because this is is going to be mind-blowing. You have the Jews who had converted to following Jesus, making an argument that the Gentiles have to fit their mold to have access to Jesus, right? Are we following? This means yes. This means I'm asleep, right? It's that, so we need to get this. We need to understand this. We need to make sure that the Gentiles follow our mold to become a Jesus follower. It's the same thing we do all week. When we judge our neighbor or we judge whoever or when we see somebody that proclaims to be a Christian or we see a documentary about a church that's had a moral failure, we're like, oh, look at them. They need to do what we're doing. And we we do the same thing. We do the same thing. And so then Peter, at the end, just as he did to us, you know what Peter is saying? Peter is saying, actually, you Jewish converts need to do it the way the Gentiles are doing it to have access to Jesus. He's saying that, that, that it's actually not about the works or the circumcision or anything like that. It's, it's about the way the Gentiles are just accepting it by faith. I mean, wow. Totally turns the tables on everything that, that, that the, the Jewish converts are talking about. I mean, it's amazing. Just as he did to us, Peter's saying there's no difference between them and us. There's no difference at all. And so he goes on in verse 9, and he says, He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. There's, there's that faith part. So there's no discrimination. And, and in today's terms, that means there's no discrimination between you and between the person out there that's living some life that we don't agree with or that we say is wrong or that we judge. So before we get high and mighty in here, We need to realize that, you know what, there's not really much different between us and those out there, right? You know, it's easy to point a finger at somebody out there that's drunk or somebody out there that's living in a way that that we don't want to agree with because it makes us uncomfortable. But how many of us in here 
are secretly addicted to pornography or we're secretly drinking too much or we secretly hate our neighbor or, you know, it's like let's not get into that relationship where it's them versus us or it's us versus them because it doesn't work out. Because Peter's saying God doesn't discriminate. You know why God doesn't discriminate? Because he knows we're all equally messed up. And so it goes on in verse 10. He says this. He says, Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? So what, what Peter is saying here is he's saying, We couldn't even get it right. You know, hey, I could see Peter being like, hey, guys, uh, how many years did you wander around in the desert? Because it wasn't supposed to be 40. That trip through the desert was supposed to be a whole lot shorter than that. But you know why it was 40? It's because you guys weren't all that great. You needed 40 years to get your heart right and to get the generation's heart right to step into the promised land. So Peter's like, why are we holding these people that didn't even grow up in our culture to the same standards that, that we could not even meet. Why are we in the church holding people out there to a standard that we can't meet here? And we're expecting them to meet a standard to be accepted here? That doesn't work. Come on, that's not right. And so Peter goes on here in, in, in verse 11. He says, no. He takes a stance. We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. There it is, Peter again. He puts the nail in the coffin just as they are. We are saved just as they are. That means that we're saved through faith. We're saved through the simple message of the gospel. It's not complicated. It's not any more complicated than that. Jesus is not a complicated person. He's simple. You know what? I would hate to get to heaven. You know, I die and and I go to heaven and I'm standing there at the gates and Jesus is like, okay, well, I'll let you in. But you know what, Chris? I had this amazing life planned for you, but you weren't smart enough to figure it out. See, that's not, Jesus isn't tricky. Jesus wants the best for us. So he made it simple for us. And this is a reminder to the Jewish converts that this thing stays simple. This thing is simple. It's about just putting faith in Jesus as your Savior. Now, to finish up the story here, and we're almost done with the message, and we'll, I'll bring it home to you guys here, which I'm really excited about doing. But in, in verse 13, I'm going to pull my Bible out here for this as well. So this guy, James, James is actually the brother of Jesus. Now, what's interesting about James here is James did not believe that his brother Jesus was the resurrected uh, Lord. He didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. James instead thought Jesus' his brother was a phony. But now, James is in this conversation because James is different. Why is James different? Because of the resurrection. There's a, there's a theme. We keep saying this thing over and over and over again. The resurrection makes James different. James is in this conversation. Not only is he in the conversation, James is in charge of the church. He is in charge of mega church Jerusalem. He is first Christian church Jerusalem. He is the pastor, the leader. He is the one that's in charge of the whole thing. And he is because he watched Jesus resurrect. And he, he, says, he says, brothers, listen to me. Now, this next verse that comes up is a verse that, that shapes the way we do things. And it shapes our why. Why do we do what we do? Because people need Jesus. And it says in verse 19, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. That's such a simple statement. Why would we make it difficult for anybody that's not us to turn to God? So this is what shapes why we do what we do here at South Point Church. This is what shapes my burden. This is what shapes the burden of the church. Is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. We shouldn't make it difficult for anybody. And now, after, after James says this, that he would go on to, to give, he would say, okay, if you want conditions, I'll give you a couple conditions. And they're going to take this back to the church in, in Antioch. And he says, instead, and you don't have this verse on the screen, but it's not a, a huge deal. 
Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. So James gives them three things. He says, don't eat food polluted by idols, abstain from sexual immorality, and don't eat meat strangled from animals and and from blood. So what, what James is doing there is saying, okay, here's three things. Guess what? These three things are not in the 613 laws. They're not. So the three things that James tells them are not part of any Jewish law. Not, they're not part of that. Instead, he's saying that, that I want to make sure there's unity in the church. So let's make sure that the focus stays on God and not on idols or on others. It's singular. God is singular. That's the only one that we believe in. And the whole sexual immorality thing, man, that could be defined a hundred different ways. But you know what it's really defined as? It's defined as you need to treat your brother, your sister, your friend the way that God loves them. Treat them the way that God treats you. Treat them the way that you would want to be treated. He's saying that, that we are to respect everyone there. See, James gives these simple things. And with these simple things, they would then take this with this powerful message here, and they would write a letter, and then they would send it back to Antioch. And then when it gets back to Antioch, they read the letter to the people, and the church is now decided. So now, not only is this amazing thing in Antioch kicked off, what would be the future of the Christian church? We can officially say that Christianity is officially unhitched from the Old Covenant, and instead, it is hitched to Jesus. This is such a a pivotal thing for us. It's such an important thing for us to understand. So that, that takes me back to the first question that I asked you guys. And that's, why, why are we here? So now it's not, why are you here and why is the church here? The question is, is why are we here? Why are you here? Why am I here? Why we? Why are we here? Well, The simple answer is is that we're here because we need Jesus. We need Jesus. We need love. When we don't feel love from anyone else, we can have love from Jesus. We need acceptance. When we don't feel acceptance from anybody else, we have Jesus, a man that gave his life for us. We are accepted. When we don't have a father that we can lean on, we need Jesus because he's our perfect heavenly father. When we don't have somebody to tell our secrets to, we need Jesus because we can confess our heart to Jesus and he loves us no matter what. When we don't feel good about ourselves, when we're dealing with depression or anxiety, when we're dealing with our addictions or our sins, we have nobody else that we can turn to. When the 12 step method fails, when all the therapy fails or it doesn't get the results that you think, we need Jesus because he doesn't fail us. And he is there for us. Why are we here, guys? Because we need Jesus. Now, this takes me to something that has just been beating my heart and soul over the last couple weeks. And it's this, the empty chair. And if you've been here, you've heard me talk about it. So there's, there's two empty chairs in this room. There's the empty chair, as in the chair that no one is sitting in. And that breaks my heart because we need Jesus. Everyone needs Jesus. And so for every empty chair in the room, guess what? There's somebody out there that needs Jesus that's not in here. And it's not about building South Point Church. This is about building people that know that Jesus loves them, people that know that they need Jesus. And this is a place where they can come and have a a connection and an interaction with Jesus. I want to build a church that has a crazy burden that is broken for the empty chair. I want, I see, I look around and I see the empty chair and it just, it just crushes my, my soul. Not because I'm upset that there's empty chairs in the room, but because I'm just crushed that there is somebody out there that desperately needs this and they're not here or they're not in church anywhere. See, we are no longer as a church going to go another year without baptism, going to go another year without salvation. We're no longer as a church going to go another year without growing this community. We're no longer as a church going to go another year where we're okay with 150 chairs. Listen, there's 6 million people in this city, 6 million people in Cape Town. 
And, and we're not, I'm not okay with, with 200 chairs in a room and with 40 or 50 of them being empty. And the reason that I'm not okay is because we need Jesus. Now, the second empty chair that I want to talk about before I pray, it's, it's actually the chair that someone is sitting in it, but the person that's sitting in it maybe is empty. Now, if this is you, it's okay. You're in a safe space. You're, you're, in, you're in a loved space. And I get emotional because I've been empty sitting in a chair. And yes, the chair is not empty. It has a person in it. But somebody out there, and I know it's somebody out there because this is on my heart, somebody out there feels empty. And so this message, this is for you as well. You need Jesus. And it's not you need Jesus, so therefore you should. No, it's you need Jesus, so just let go and let Jesus encounter you. Because that, that's what we believe in here. And so I'm going to pray for us. The band's going to come out and sing a song. And in this song, what... I want to give you a moment to think about this whole Jesus thing. Think about this whole resurrection thing. And let, let's just remember, we're here today because of what Jesus did after the cross. And that didn't stop because Jesus would then shape the entire creation of the church. And because of Peter and Paul and because of what happened in Antioch and because of all the other things, we get to sit here in this room and worship God, but also be loved by God. So that's our reminder. But I want you to think about the empty chair next to you, the empty chair in the row in front of you, the empty chair behind you, the empty chair that's in here in this heart. And I, I just want you to, to pray that that empty chair just gets touched by Jesus. That's, it's that simple. Let's just pray that prayer as a church. Let's pray it together. Lord Jesus, I pray that...